Hallelujah. But are you ready for the word of God? Okay, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of First Samuel chapter 17. Very, very familiar text. We have ministered this text here over and over and over. It's this account of Goliath. How I many of you remember that account? Yes, that Philistine giant who threatened God's armies. But we are going in a direction that have not been taken before, primarily because it is what God wants to do for us uh, this evening. So our text is taken from 1 Samuel 17. Have you got it as yet? All right, hold it for a while. I would first like to read one of my favorite texts that relates back to the Old Testament and even now in today it relates to things in the New Testament. It's found in Romans 15.4. You don't have to turn to it. You could take my word for it, but you can read along with me. Romans 54 tells us, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. So if we would go into the Old Testament, we would see that there are many accounts that would seem to be just the stories. But let me say tonight, they are not just stories. They are actual accounts. Apart from the fact that they are true happenings, God in his wisdom and foresight had them placed there specifically. God, in knowing what you and I would have to go through sometime, had these accounts written specially so that we can understand and glean from them, among other things, the power of God in delivering us from what may seem to be impossible situations that we may face. And in so doing, we would have patience in waiting on God and comfort in the scriptures and have hope. God is good. Yes, is. I said God is good. Yes, all the time he is good and we want to know that he cares for us. So trusting that we all know of the account of Goliath and David, I would only be reading a few verses to make the point of the message for tonight clear to us. We're going to be reading from verses 1 and 11 and 39 and 47. That's 20 verses of scripture for those of you who have not read for a while. Okay, so here we go. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle again, to battle, and were gathered together at Shukor, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shukor and Azikan and in Ephesindam. Damin. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. As we go along, I will break that down in today's language for you. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. 
And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 39. And David girded on his sword, girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved them. This is Saul's armor that he put on David. David tried them on, but he did not use them. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And, his, and, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that you come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite you and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I specifically took these verses so that what God wants to say to us tonight will come out of them and we will understand that the God we serve is a great, great, great God. So we see the scenario of the battle outlined at the beginning of the text. The Philistines versus Israel, the people of God. That's the scenario. A champion of the Philistines named Goliath comes forward to challenge anyone who will represent the army of Israel. The stakes are high. The winner of the battle will be considered as having prevailed over the entire army of the other, who then will then have to be servants of the, the other. Goliath, we are told, was six cubits and a span, nine feet and seven inches for those of us who are of yesteryear, or approximately 300 centimeters for the younger one. Now, some time ago, I preached on this, and before 
I ministered on it. I went and looked at that pole there and measured it. And I actually saw that it measures around nine feet. So I want us to look at that pole and see Goliath. That is the height of Goliath. He had a helmet of brass on his head and was armed with a coat of mail. That is a flexible armor of interlinked wings, rings weighing 166 pounds or 58 kilograms of brass. His legs were shielded with brass shields as were his shoulders and his spear head was 15 pounds or 6.8 kilograms. Added to that, he had someone with a shield in front of him. And who was his opponent? David, a young Jewish boy. And if we know Jews, they are short. And he's a young boy. Just past his teens, 20 years or so, and possibly weighing just as much as Goliath's coat of brass. His weapon, a slingshot and five stones in a bag. And what was he wearing? Normal clothes. Nothing, he was naked. Normal clothes. This scenario is played out every day in the life of a child of God. This same scenario. Not in those details. In our strength, in our strength, we are like little David in confrontation of a Goliath who is a messenger of Satan, the devil. One would imagine that Goliath, having this seeming advantage over David, I say seeming, because if you're a child of God, no one has the advantage over you. I say seeming. One would imagine that Goliath, having this seeming advantage over David, he would without hesitation advance towards David and crush him like a bug on the wall. I mean, just think about the situation. Imagine, let us see Goliath. Let us look at David. Let us look at all the armor, the weaponry around him. And little David is in front of him. No weapon but a slingshot. Normal clothes. just as our adversary will do to us in our own strength. But what instead did Goliath do? Verse 41 tells us, as Goliath came with a man and a shield in front of him, note well, with all the advantage of his height, the armor he wore, the weapon in his hand and a man with a shield in front of him with all that drawing near to David he did not outright attack him I don't know if you are seeing this in the scriptures but when I read it this is what I am seeing by the spirit of God a giant armed to the teeth, a little boy in front of him with a slingshot, and he's challenging him. Don't you think that that giant would normally have just run up on David and crushed him outright? That's what the devil will do to us in our own strength. But there must have been something about David that Goliath realized he had to be cautious 
about. He had to be cautious about it. Can I say to you tonight that with all the power of our adversary, all the power that he possesses, he has to be cautious of how he advances against the children of God. Don't you ever think for one moment, with all the power that the devil has, that he can just come up against us as children of God without being cautious. Why? He knows the scriptures. The devil knows the scriptures. He quoted scripture for Jesus in the wilderness. Remember when Jesus said, it is written that man shall not eat by, man shall not live by bread alone, but with every word, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil tempted him, showed him something else and says, and it is also written, he quoted the scriptures from Deuteronomy. He knows the scriptures. As a matter of fact, I dare say that the devil knows the scriptures more than you and me. He does. He knows the scriptures. And he knows that as children of God, possessors of the very spirit of God in us, and I'm making emphasis on this because too often we forget who we are in Christ Jesus. We think we are just a bunch of people in a church, but we must be reminded that we are just not normal people. We are not average people. We are not ordinary people. We are people of God having the power of God in us and we must be consciously aware of that all the time something that we fail to do when situations and circumstances arise against us we fail to recognize who we are in Christ Jesus but the devil knows he knows that as children of God we possess the very Holy Spirit of God in us. He knows that he has to be careful of how he advances against us. Just as Goliath was careful with all his armor and his height and size, he did not run up and attack little boy David. What did he do? We will read about it in a little while. It may seem like that to us in our everyday experiences that we are, that the devil cannot, or rather the devil can advance against us. It may seem like that, but listen to what the word of God tells us. When Jesus rose from the dead, he declared in Matthew 28, 18, that all power not some power all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth all power is Jesus's own when he rose from the dead that was given to him by the father and what does Luke ten nineteen tells us behold I give you power to do what? To tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So though it may seem that the devil doesn't have to be careful in advancing against us, he knows what we possess. And I tell you tonight that he has to be careful. He doesn't just run up and do things to us, as we will see in our account. So as it was with Goliath, he knew that as an Israelite, David was one of God's very own 
And he knew as a result of that, he had, in spite of his advantage over David, he had to be careful. Why do you keep saying that Goliath had to be careful? Well, let's look and see. As I read the account, I did not see Goliath run up and attack David. What I saw in verse 42 was that when Goliath looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He started to belittle him. He did not run up on David and smite him. He started to belittle him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with a stick? I mean, why is he talking to David? Why doesn't he go and just crush David? He has all the advantage over him. What is he doing with this talk? He said, come to me and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the field. All this talk, even though he was bigger and badder than David, all this talk. He had armor that weighed more than David himself had weighed. He possessed a weapon, had a shield bearer in front of him. But he will not advance directly to engage David in the fight. He said to David, you come to me. You ever see those bajons or want to play bajon? They want to fight somebody, but they're begging somebody to hold them back. Yeah. Hold me back. <laughs> he did not advance to David. But he called him David. Man towering over David, armed to the teeth, have a man with a shield in front of him. But he's not drawing close to David. He invited David to come to him. What I see happening in this account that I can learn from, according to Romans 15:4, and have comfort and hope in God is that in attacking us the devil has to use psychological warfare in attacking us. Psychological warfare is a device of our adversary the devil. He wages psychological warfare. This is what this is what Goliath was doing to David. He did not advance on him as I said. He did not run up and smite him. But he gave him a lot of talk to discourage him. To make him believe he was a nothing in his sight. It was purely a psychological warfare that he was warring against Goliath. He and the devil does the same thing to us. He does not run up and advance against us like that. He first fights us with a psychological warfare. He plays with our minds first. He plays with our minds with negative suggestions, suggesting things. When we are faced with circumstances that are negative in our lives, when we are experiencing pain and hurt and emotional discomfort of some, he always puts things in our minds that are not there. I'll give you some examples. We are crying out to God and we are waiting on God. And time lapses, and what do we hear? God will not come true for you. I am not deserving of God's help. Or you are not deserving of God's help. Your situation is impossible. 
These are the thoughts you are thinking, but they are not your thoughts. They are thoughts that are put there by the enemy. It's a psychological warfare to bring you down. I myself, in a situation in my life many years ago, Christian as I was, preacher that I was, I said, I can't see any way God could bring me out of this. I said that. Well, it was a thought in my mind. Now I know who placed it there. How many a Christian have felt that they have messed up so that God will not help them? Listen to me tonight, my friends. God is good. And he doesn't depend, it's, it does not depend on how good we are for God to help us. He is good all the time. And there is no distance we can go from God that he cannot reach us and will not reach us. We only have to think of the prodigal son. The account of the prodigal son. What did Jesus say about that? The son took all that he had to get from his father and he went a whoring. End up eating pig's food. But when he came to his senses and he says, my father has more than this. Let me go back to my father. When he spun around and started walking, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, when the father saw him afar off coming, you think the father would have turned his back on his son? Not the father that we serve. When he saw him afar off coming, he ran to him. Took his cloak and threw it around his son. He didn't ask his son why he went. Where you went, what you did. Nothing like that we read in the account. This is the God that we serve. Don't let the enemy tell you you have done this or you have done that and this is the reason why God is not helping you. It's a psychological warfare. Are you with me tonight? Don't allow it. I have messed up so God will not help me. That's not the God of this Bible. Listen, if that were the case, none of us would have got help from the Lord because all of us have messed up sometime or another. Let me see your hand. You have never ever messed up. <laughs> but God has helped us. The condition I am feeling in my body, what's the first thought that comes? Cancer. Always cancer. You have a toothache, cancer in your jaw. I remember my dear wife sometime had a, a procedure done and they had to take the organ and send it for testing. And a friend came around looking for her the night. And you know, he was, the person was meaning well, but suggested that the reason why they sent for the test is to determine if it has cancer. And that night my wife told me she could not sleep. All she thinking about was cancer, 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 until she went back into the word that she heard over the Friday night services and started to pull from them what God says. And chose to believe what God says in his word than what the devil was putting in her mind that she had cancer. He plays with our minds. You get a serious headache, you're getting a stroke. Always something negative he would look to sow in our minds. And I can't name every negative thought that the enemy will place in our minds. They're too numerous to mention. But the point of the message is that our enemy knows who we are 
in Christ Jesus. And with every circumstance of life, and life will have circumstances, negative ones. There's no doubt about that. The devil will take advantage of them and wage a psychological warfare to cause fear. To cause fear and doubt in our minds. So as to erase or whittle down whatever faith we may have in God. Fear and doubt is the exact opposite to faith. You cannot exercise faith if you have fear and doubt in your mind. They are opposite to each other. They just do not blend. You either have faith or you are fearful or you are doubting but they just don't mix and this is what the devil always use when he wants to bring us down spirit not spiritual psychological warfare play with our minds so that we would begin to doubt question and lose our faith as we fall into fear. So what do we do when this is happening? What do we do when the devil is playing with our minds, dropping thoughts that are negative, contrary to what God would have us believe? What do we do? One thing we cannot do is to stop him from putting those thoughts there. But one, what we have to do when he put those thoughts there is to counter those thoughts. And this is something that as Christians we fail to do so many times. Let's look at David in his situation with Goliath. David did not accommodate what Goliath was saying to him. Instead, he talked back to Goliath. He talked back when Goliath was bumping his gum. David said, you come to me with a sword and the and with a spear and with a shield but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled David countered what Goliath was trying to do to him wage a psychological warfare against him to break his faith to break his trust in God. But David knew the God that he served. If we were to go back into the account, we didn't read it. When Saul questioned David about his ability to fight Goliath, David looked back in time and he said, there was a time when a bear and there was another time when a lion took one of my lambs and I went after him and I smote him I held him by the beard and I smote him and I took back the lamb and the same God that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear same God is going to deliver me from Goliath. He had his faith. He had his trust. How so? Because he had had previous experiences. I dare any one of you 
to stand here and tell me tonight that you have not had an experience in your life that God has delivered you from. I dare you. Stand up if you could. And this is what we have got to remember. Don't listen to what people have to say. Don't listen to what the devil has to say. Know what God has to say about you. Know that you are a child of the living God. Know that he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end. God says that in his word. We must know that we know that we know this God that we serve. Be reading the Bible. Who was it that said, they that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. We must know this God and this is why he gives us past experiences in life. Some of them we would have thought we could never come through it. But we did. We did. He brought us through. This is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's an unchanging God. You come to me with a sword, and you come to me with a spear, and you come to me with a shield, and you're giving me all that old talk to bring down my faith in my God, well, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Let me say to you tonight, like David, no matter what negative thoughts the enemy will attempt to sow in your minds, you must know whose you are. You must know whose you are and be able to counter every device of psychological warfare against your mind with the knowledge that God says in his word that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or even think according to the power that worketh in you. Do you have that power tonight? The power of the Holy Spirit? Well, in addition to the power of the Holy Spirit, he has given you other powers. He has given you the power of his name, the power of his blood, the power of his resurrection, and the power of praise and worship. The power of prayer. We are a powerful people. Yeah. But do we realize it? Do we recognize it? Are we operating like that? When the enemy wages this psychological warfare in our minds. Do we wonder if what we are thinking is true? Listen to me. Do like David. Do not accommodate any negative thought that the enemy puts into your mind about any situation, any circumstance that you have. This is his first, this is his first move. This, is, this device of psychological warfare is the first move to bring down your faith, to cause a doubt, you lose the trust, and then he's going to move in for the kill. Don't allow it to happen. Talk back. We fail at times to talk back to the devil. When he does us what he wants, instead of telling him where to get off, here we, oh God. No, you don't talk to God then. The devil talking to you, Talk back to the devil. What did Jesus say when Peter tried to hold him back from going down to Jerusalem? What did he say? 
get the hands of Satan. You savor the things that be of men and not of God. Talk back. Tell him to go where he belongs. Go to hell. It's not a bad word, you know. Tell him, go to hell. Not that he will go, it's God has to place him there. But you would understand that you mean business. You are not accommodating the thoughts that he put in your mind. The question is tonight, do we believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think? Above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. If you do believe that, let's never give place to the devil in our minds. Don't give place to the devil. Every toehold you give him, he's going to take a foothold. When he gets a foothold, well, you know the rest. Degree by degree, he's going to move in for the kill. And what did he start with? Just thoughts. Just thoughts. Thoughts in our minds. Just as Goliath, big as he was, bad as he was, strong as he was, armed as he was, he did not advance directly against David because he knew that as an Israelite, David was a child of God. Are you a child of God tonight? Are you a child of God tonight? Have you been bombarded in your minds with negative thoughts concerning the situations and circumstances of your life? That God can't help you. He's not hearing you. Or any such negative thought. God is saying to us tonight, fight back. Fight back. Resist. Resist. Resist means to fight. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God bless you tonight. Stand where you are. I always say, if you're going to preach the word of, if you're going to clap the word of God, clap the word of God, or don't clap at all. They tell me you are, you're clapping. But you are clapping the word of God. Don't patty cake God. As we sing this chorus, if you are here tonight and this word, was meaningful to you that you believe that God spoke to you through this word tonight totally different direction of the Goliath account sent by God specifically for you I want you to come to the altar I want to do something about fear and doubt that the enemy wants to create in our minds to belittle the faith that we have in God. As we sing the song, come to the altar, let us pray.
have to confess. I must confess that there is nothing I can do to stop the thoughts in your mind. Absolutely nothing I can do. As much as I would love to help you get rid of those thoughts, I can't. But you can. You can. You can take control of your thoughts. Don't let the enemy control your thoughts. You can take control of your thoughts. If you don't, there is no help for you. Because the, the thoughts are in your mind. Whether you are thinking them or the devil has placed them there, the fact of the matter is you have got to take control. You have got to resist what the devil is doing in your mind. Your mind is the battlefield of the devil. Always remember that. And if you don't fight back for your mind, the devil is going to continue to rule there. Okay? You have a power within you. God has not left us defenseless here upon this earth. He has put his spirit. The world is defenseless. But you are children of God. You are not defenseless. You have the spirit of God in you. The spirit of God gives you the capacity to do everything and anything that God will have you do. So that there is no way you can't. You just have to exercise your mind to do the thing. And this is what you are here for tonight. I'm going to pray with you that you have understanding and that you will employ the means that God has given to you so that you can take back your mind from the enemy. Don't let him engage you in psychological warfare there. You talk back to him. You resist. You resist. You do not accommodate the thoughts. Yes, you can't stop them from coming, but you could choose not to accommodate them. You can't stop the thoughts from coming. They are wise, cunning devices of the enemy. They are like swords. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us that. We can't stop them, but we could do something about when they enter, we can resist them. Come on, lift your hearts to the Lord. Precious God and Father, I lift up your people. I see, I know, and I understand so clearly the advantage that the enemy takes over us because of our minds. Because he has access to our minds, he takes advantage of it. But precious Lord, within every child of God is your spirit, the spirit that enables us the en enabling power of God within us that we are enabled to do everything that you would have us do and so precious Lord I lift them up before you and I pray that henceforth as of tonight not only here at the altar, but none of us in this congregation will ever again entertain any thought that the enemy puts in our mind. Cause us to know and understand that we have the power to resist every thought and bring them according to your word in Corinthians. Bring in every thought and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God bringing them into subjection of the Spirit of God indwelling us this is the power that God has given to us and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth I confront every spirit of doubt 
I confront every spirit of doubt that the enemy has sown in the minds of God's people here at, ho at this altar. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, spirits of doubt. You are lying spirits. You are lying spirits. Our God is able. Our God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And if you say otherwise, you are a liar. We choose to believe what God says in his word rather than what you put in our minds. And precious God, we thank you for the enabling power of the Holy Spirit of God in every member at the altar here this morning, tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Learn to talk back. Learn to talk back. Resist means to fight and the God has promised us in his word, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Hallelujah. You can go back to your seats. Hallelujah.